Session 2, Creation and Fall. The opening hymn is, This is My Father's World. Like the canticle of Daniel, the hymn proclaims the greatness of God looking upon his creation. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, grant us a spirit of wisdom and insight to know you clearly. Enlighten our innermost vision that we may know the great hope to which you have called us the wealth of your glorious heritage to be distributed among the members of the Church, and the immeasurable scope of your power in us who believe. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God for ever and ever. Amen. The reading today is a book, a reading from the Old Testament, so um, the priest will not be reading it. A reading from the book of Genesis. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, You shall not eat it, or even touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what the Church teaches in brief about creation and the fall. God made us. He made us in his own image and likeness to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world. 
and to be happy with him forever in the next. Our likeness to God is chiefly in our soul, which, like God, is a spirit and is immortal. Our soul can never die. We must take more care of our souls, therefore, than of our bodies. For Christ said, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? Unfortunately, we human be humans inherit the, the guilt and stain of the sin committed by Adam, who was the origin and head of all mankind. This sin, called original sin, was the sin of disobedience, which Adam and Eve committed when they ate the forbidden fruit. All mankind has contracted its guilt and stain, with the exception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who, through the merits of her Divine Son, was preserved from it from the very moment of her conception. So, creation and the fall. God is good and all-powerful. He created the world good, not perfect, but in a state of journeying toward its ultimate perfection. And he cares for everything he created. However, moral evil, sin, is present all through human history. It cannot be ignored or dismissed as a developmental flaw, a psychological weakness, a mistake, or the necessary consequence of an inadequate social structure. Ever since the first man and woman committed the original sin, the world has been virtually inundated or flooded by sin. In fact, the very condition of the world as a whole is sinful. So that we can speak of the sin of the world, not just the sins. Sin is the reverse side of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news is that he is our healer. The reverse side is that we are sick. The good news is that he is our shepherd. The reverse side is that we are sheep. The good news is that he is our saviour. The reverse side is that we are sinners. Considering ourselves or being described as sheep isn't very complimentary. I remember when I was a child that we had sheep on the farm and the first thing they would do is they'd see a blackberry patch or skiox or briars and go straight in underneath for the green grass which was always underneath there, get themselves thoroughly entangled and caught. We'd go in there and release them. The, as you came in to release them, they'd go further in and get more tangled. You'd finally get them loose. They'd scamper out across the field and rush off into the next patch of briars and get entangled again. And I can't help but think we're so like that. It was a good description of human beings. Mm -hmm. We do things wrong and then we go back into the same faults again and again and again. But Christ came to release us. So the good news is that he is our savior. The reverse side is that we are sinners. Both aspects are important. The sick must accept the doctor's diagnosis before they can be healed. Sinners must be convinced of their guilt before they can be pardoned. We must understand original sin before we can understand salvation. However, before we can understand sin, we must know how God created humans to relate to him in love. For only then can we see sin as it really is, a rejection of God and a misuse of the freedom he gives us. First, therefore, let us describe humans in their original innocence. Immediately, we see what looks like a contradiction. 
The church teaches that God created humans happy and good, but that they disobeyed God and fell to what we see today. However, science teaches that humans started out as apes, but gradually rose to what we see today. There are two misunderstandings here. First, the church does not claim that Adam and Eve were superior to us in learning, culture, language, the making of artifacts, etc. Even before their fall, they might seem to us, if we could see them today, to be savages, creatures to be exploited or at best patronized. In many respects, therefore, humans have risen from the condition of Adam and Eve. It is in quite different respects, we shall describe them in this talk, that Adam and Eve were our superiors. Second, the church agrees with science that in creating the world, God progressed from the less perfect to the more perfect. The Bible says that God did not create everything all at once, but took six days. He shaped Adam himself out of something lower and less perfect. The Bible calls it the clay of the ground, before he blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The church, then, has no quarrel with the theory of biological evolution. Perhaps we should say the evolution of bodies. I'm just going to read footnote 25, because this is important. The church, Pope Pius XII, in fact, said the church has no quarrel with the theory of biological evolution, that is, the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter. However, since souls are immediately created by God, again, Pope Pius XII, the church does not accept materialist, reductionist, or spiritualist evolution. The church does not agree with some people. This is not scientific. This is what some people make of science to say that our souls evolved out of pre-existing matter. The church says no, but the church has no quarrel with the idea that our bodies evolved from pre-existing matter, even pre-existing living matter. We'll come back to this point. It isn't really germane to this talk, but it's something that bothers people. The Bible does not give us the details. It is not a science book. Its purpose in describing the origin and makeup of the universe is not to provide us with a scientific treatise, but to state the correct relationships of man with God and with the universe. Any other purpose is alien to its intentions, and that's Pope John Paul II. So we aren't given the details of the creation of the human body, except that it came from something pre-existing. Humans have a unique place in creation. Made in God's image, our nature is both spiritual and material. We are body and soul. We have only one nature, not two, but in that nature, spirit and matter are united. We are most like God in our souls, but our bodies also image God, for they are human bodies precisely because they are animated by spiritual souls. A human is a person, not just something, but someone. As persons, we are capable of self-knowledge, of self-possession, and of entering into communion with other persons. Now, that's a word we're going to come across a lot, so let's talk about it now. Communion means union with, not a fusion or melting together, which abolishes difference, but the unity of two distinct beings. Union is seen in Christianity as communion, unity as community, unity with a distinct other. 
Of all the material things that God has created, only humans have the capacity to know and love him. God established the newly created Adam and Eve in friendship and familiarity with himself, as we see from the fact that he settled them in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and care for it. Moreover, from the very beginning, he called them to share in his own divine life by knowledge and love. This divine life, God's life, would transform their human nature. For example, by their human nature, they could expect to die. But by the divine nature to which God planned to raise them, they would be immortal. Adam and Eve's first state is called the state of original holiness and justice, or original innocence. In this state, they enjoyed perfect harmony with the rest of creation. To them, work meant collaboration with God in bringing the rest of creation to the perfection God intended for it, as when God brought all the birds and animals to Adam for him to name them. We'll come back to this point, but work was not a punishment for the fall. What God specifically said was that from now on, Adam could not get food without toiling towards the, the sweat of his brow. Work meant collaboration with God. Adam and Eve also enjoyed perfect harmony with each other. But above all, they enjoyed perfect harmony within themselves. The mastery over the wor world that God offered them was above all mastery of self. They were totally free from the things that enslave us, the pleasures of the senses, covetousness for earthly goods, and the desire for self-assertion. Don't we find self-control difficult? Now, yes. Yeah. Adam and Eve were unimpaired and ordered in their whole being. That is, nothing in them impaired anything else. Everything was in order. In contrast, we suffer internal conflict among our desires. For example, when we want to eat chocolate, but also to stay slim. Or to go on a hike, but also to sleep in. We also suffer internal conflict between our desires and what we know to be right. For example, when we want something owned by someone else but we know that we should not steal. All the time, every day, you run into these conflicts. Now, as we often do, we turn to C.S. Lewis to help our imaginations. I'm just going to read footnote 51. Lewis says, I am a rationalist. For me, reason. The Latin for reason is ratio. For me, reason is the natural origin, organ rather, of truth. But imagination is the organ of meaning. So the not unlikely tale, which is what Lewis calls it, which follows, comes from C.S. Lewis, The Problem of Pain. So here's how he fills in. The Bible, again, as Pope John Paul said, is not a science book. It doesn't give us that kind of detail. So here's Lewis from his imagination. For millions of years, God improved the animal form, which he planned to raise to the level of humans who would image himself. He gave it hands whose thumb could be applied to each of the fingers. Very important ability. And jaws and teeth and throat, capable of the articulation necessary for speech and a brain complex enough for the electric and chemical changes that embody rational thought. He made it clever enough to do things that a modern archaeologist might take as proof of its humanity. I'm going to give you an example which intrigues me. I'm reading footnote 52. Like the orangutan, Fu Manchu's wire which he used to slide between a locked door and its casing 
so as to slip the latch. He made it himself and bent it into a shape which allowed him to hide it from his keepers between his upper lip and gum. For his ingenuity, he was made an honorary member of the American Association of Locksmiths. Apparently, the keepers found him and his family outside his cage every morning, so they put a better lock on it. Still, he was getting out. Then they started filming what he was doing at night with infrared photography and convinced themselves that somehow he was manipulating this lock. But they couldn't for some time find out where he was hiding it until one day he gave a big grin and somebody saw the end. Very clever. But I would say that if you found the remains of that orangutan together with this tool, you'd say, this was a human. But no, it was still only an animal because all its physical and psychological activity was directed to purely material and natural goals. Eventually, God created Adam and Eve from a male and a female animal by giving them a new kind of consciousness. This is not something that developed naturally. It's something God had to do directly. They did not cease to be animals, and we have no reason to suppose that he made any change in their physical form. And of course, we know, I'm looking at footnote 53, we know that since Adam and Eve, human bodies have continued to evolve, producing the present rich variety of persons, cultures, and peoples. How wonderful the different persons, the different peoples of the world are, and how different we are, and yet how... The same. Similar, yeah. So the Bible gives us no reason to suppose that God made any change in their physical form, but now he, they could reflect on themselves, saying, I and me. Now they could know and love God. Now they could make judgments about truth, beauty, and goodness. This new consciousness was not limited like ours, to what was going on in their brains, but extended to all their physical and psychological activity. In Adam and Eve, organic processes like digestion and circulation and all the others conformed to their will, not the patterns of biology. Their organs submitted desires to their will, not in spite of them, but because they chose. Almost, I will digest this, whatever I've just eaten. To them, for example, sleep was not the loss of consciousness we undergo, but deliberate and conscious repose. There's a beautiful poem by uh, C.S. Lewis called The Atom at Night, which brings out this idea. Even their bodily processes of decay and repair were subject to their will so they may have had control over the length of their lives. This is an idea that Tolkien, Tolkien was a convinced Catholic. I'm just going to look at it. Well, no, I won't read it, but it's, it would be a good idea, if you're interested in this, to read Tolkien's idea from The Lord of the Rings. Besides having command of themselves, Adam and Eve had command of all the lower animal lives, with which they came in contact. Even now we hear of rare individuals like St. Francis who have a mysterious power of taming animals. And it's amazing how different different people, uh, their different abilities with animals mm. and how good some people are at just controlling them. Lewis fleshes out all these ideas in his book Perilandra. Perilandra is the name of another planet the lady of that planet, like Eve in our world, is familiar with God. She often says that God is telling her something. She is strong, able to pull herself up sheer cliffs. She is never the passive recipient of any emotion or thought. Feeling, thinking, and even sleeping are things she does, not things that happen to her. When she sleeps, for example, 
Her face is full of expression and intelligence. So as I say, Lewis fleshes out the ideas which are there in the book of Genesis with his very Christian imagination. On earth, after Adam and Eve had fallen, we became subject to death, but we did not learn to die quickly. As the Bible testifies, Noah and his descendants died, according to the Bible, at the ages of 950, 500, 438, 433, 464, 239, 239, 230 and 148 in that order. Abraham, we know, was 75 when God called him, 100 when he begot Isaac, and 175 when he died. Now, some people say, oh, this is impossible. The time it takes the earth to go around the sun must have changed, and so the year is different. But I can tell you as a physics teacher, it is far more unbelievable to me that something could have changed the orbit of the Earth than that these people did die at these advanced ages. And that is why, it makes sense to me, that's why the author of the book recorded the age. And besides, look at the difference in life expectancy in our world. I'm over 80 now, and but in past generations... That would have been excessively old. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the way in which, without violating any of the teaching in Genesis, things might have happened. God created Adam and Eve in his image and established them in his friendship. However, they could not be his friends as equals, for they and God were different kinds of beings. They were created while God was their creator. They were not self-existent while he is. Their relationship with God, therefore, could not be what mathematicians call symmetrical. That is, their relation to God could not be the same as God's relation to them. Their playing field could not be level. Just as you have a difference in, you might say, relationship between parents and their children, only more so, infinitely more. As created beings dependent on their creator, Adam and Eve had limits, which in trust they had to freely recognize and respect. They were limited both by the patterns of physical creation, like gravity, and by the moral norms that govern the use of freedom, like the law against murder. These limits are symbolized in the Bible. Now, that word comes from the Catechism. These limits are symbolized in the Bible by the tree of knowledge of good and bad, from which God told them that they were not free to eat. The moment you eat of it, you are surely doomed to die, he warned. Now, Pope John Paul pointed out but it is hard to imagine what, if anything, Adam and Eve would understand by the word die. For up to this point, they had not experienced death as a reality. God was asking them then to trust him. Like a mother warning a child who has never experienced burning, not to touch a hot stove. Father's the one who came up with that analogy. If you're a parent, how do you teach a child not to touch a hot stove? You can't put his hand on it so that he can see how much it hurts. By then it's too late. The damage has been done. If you use the word hot, what does the child mean by it? You have to ask the child to trust you. And from the very earliest, they understand the idea of don't do this and don't do that, or they very quickly learn it but you don't have to burn their hand in order to teach them. No. They trust you without that. In fact, if you were to place their hand on it to teach them... After that, they'd never they'd trust never you. They'd never trust you, yeah. and rightly so. So when God said, don't eat of this tree lest you die, he was asking them to trust him. God had created everything else for them, but he had created them to love him and to accept everything as a gift from him 
offering it back to him in trusting love. Living in friendship with God, therefore, meant living in free submission to him. Free submission. Both of those words are important. Now to us, submission to God, as Father pointed out, is an incessant battle. Again and again, we have to wrench our wills away from ourselves and toward him. But to Adam and Eve, it was no such thing. Whatever delight they experienced from the rest of creation, whatever joys they experienced from each other in the form of friendship and sexual love, God came first in their love and their thoughts, without painful effort, but with a joy and ease that extended to all their faculties and senses. Like all love, it entails self-surrender, but without a struggle, with only the delicious overcoming of an infinitesimal self-adherence which delighted to be overcome, of which we see a dim analogy in the rapturous, mutual self-surrenders of lovers even now. Quite recently, I was visiting a friend in the Olympic Peninsula, and there was no delay at the border and no delay for the ferry, so I had several hours to sort of put in before I could meet these friends. And so I went to the Clallam County Fair. And one of the things I watched was trials of dogs to show their obedience. And you couldn't help seeing how right the dog felt it to surrender to his or her master or mistress. They seem to love to obey. Well, There's... you've seen sheepdog yes. trials, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Again, Lewis embodies this idea in Perilandra. There, on that planet, God's command is never to sleep on the fixed land, but always to return to the floating islands before nightfall. The lady obeys this command simply for the joy of obeying. She says that even before she understood the reason for the law, she knew there was joy in looking upon the fixed island and laying down all thought of ever living there. You know, when we were ordained, we almost looked forward to the bishop asking us to do something so that we can sort of obey. automatically obey. We desire to do it. In time, God forgive us. Yeah. Uh. Now, from the moment a created being becomes conscious of God as God and itself as self, it is faced with the choice of God or self for the center. At first, Adam and Eve made God their center, not only because they found God's will for them agreeable, but also because his service was their keenest pleasure, very much like what you've just said. They accepted all their delights from him, therefore, as a matter of course as byproducts of a life directed toward him. However, God wanted them, as intelligent and free creatures, to make him the center not unthinkingly as a matter of course, but by their free choice and preferential love. To give God that preference, they themselves had to know they were doing it. Accordingly, some kind of test was necessary. As Samuel Johnson, the great English writer of the 1700s, said, we can hardly be confident of the state of our own minds, but as it stands attested by some external action, we are seldom sure that we sincerely meant what we, in fact, omitted to do. Sir Alec Guinness, the great English actor, quotes another actor, Edward Garnett, how can I know what I think until I hear what I say? And his wife, Constance, how can I tell what I feel until I see what I do? Worth meditating on. The Bible makes the same point in the book of Job. The, Lord, uh, the book of Job is written, obviously, not as a history, but as a story. And in that story, the Lord says to Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job, and that there is no one on earth like him? blameless and upright, fearing God and avoiding evil? But Satan replies, You have blessed the work of his hands, 
and it is livestock are spread over the land. But now put forth your hand and touch anything that he has, and surely he will blaspheme you to your face. And the Lord says, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand upon his person. With that, Satan takes everything Job has. In his grief, Job casts himself on the ground. But all he says is, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Many years ago, a priest pointed out to me that Job is the patron saint of men who are losing their hair. <laughs> the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Oh well, blessed be the name of the Lord. When the Lord... It's interesting to know that everything we have in yeah. this world comes from God. Yeah. But everything we have in this world will be taken away. When the Lord points out that Job still holds fast to his innocence, Satan replies, in effect, he has borne his suffering patiently so far because he seeks to avoid greater suffering and to receive greater favors from you. But now put forth your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and surely he will blaspheme you to your face. And the Lord answers, he is in your power, only spare his life. This story ends happily. Job continues to live in free submission to God, and God confirms him in his friendship, blessing his latter days more than his earlier ones. But even still, we find in Job, Job questioning, how could this be? And God's... It's more his friends who question, how yes, could this be? But he himself as well. Yeah. yeah. However, Adam and Eve's story is different. We do not know how long they maintained their original innocence, but sooner or later they sinned. That is, they stopped trusting their Creator for their happiness, and, misusing their freedom, disobeyed His command. The Bible says that their sin was to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The language is figurative but it does describe a deed that actually took place at the start of human history, and for our purposes, it describes it accurately. This is what the Catechism says about it, and also Pope Pius XII. Poetry and language and stories often portray something more accurately than details. Mm -hmm. By their sin, whatever it was, Adam and Eve chose themselves over God and against God against the requirements of their creaturely status and therefore against their own good. This is what the first human sin consisted of. It was not, as some people mistakenly think, a sin of lust. It was something different. We'll come back to it. But all subsequent sin has been the same. Disobedience toward God resulting from lack of trust in his goodness. In Paralandra, after the lady has fully and finally made the decision to obey God, she understands sin clearly. Disobedience, she says, would have been cold love and feeble trust. And out of it, how could we ever have climbed back into love and trust again? Beautifully expressed. What prompted Adam and Eve to disobey God? Consider the three things that prompt us, traditionally, the world, the flesh, and the devil. For Adam and Eve, it was not the world, for unlike us, they were not slaves to covetousness. Moreover, the whole world was already theirs. There were no worldly goods they did not already possess and enjoy. It was not the flesh, for unlike us, they were not slaves to the pleasures of the senses. Their whole organism, physical and psychological, was completely subject to their will, and their will perfectly disposed, though not compelled, to turn to God. Besides, there was no physical pleasure they did not already enjoy. And it's worth reading, I'm not going to read it, but it's worth reading footnote 98. Because a lot of people say, think that the devil offers us pleasures that God doesn't. No, 
the devil offers us God's pleasures, but at the wrong time or in the wrong way. Worth reading. Everything that God has made is good, but not necessarily good for me under at these circumstances. Time, right? yeah. As Lewis says in Paralandra, Adam and Eve had a command from God. They were utterly uncertain about the results of breaking it, and they were enjoying happiness so great that hardly any change could be for the better. Why then did they disobey? There was nothing to prompt them to choose themselves in preference to God, except the bare fact that the selves they chose were their selves. This Mine. is a point we're going to come back to. First, however, let us consider the seductive voice opposed to God which lurks behind their disobedience, the voice of the serpent in the book of Genesis. The Bible and the church's tradition see in this being a fallen angel, a devil called Satan. Now that's about halfway through, so let's take a break, come back and talk about devils, and then try and analyze Adam and Eve's sin more closely. Angels are spiritual persons with intelligence and free will, but without physical bodies. They are immortal. They do not die. By nature, they are servants and messengers of God, as we see in the Bible. And in footnote 104, which I'm not going to read, <laughs> I think uh, we put together all the examples we could find of angels in the There's Bible. So many references. Yeah throughout the scriptures, both old and new. For example, we read, Bless the Lord, all you his angels, you mighty in strength, who do his bidding, obeying his spoken word. The angels are associated with humans in adoring God. For example, the priest prays at mass, and so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory. And that comes into so many of the prefaces or those or similar words. So I'm just going to look quickly at footnote 106. Angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, and powers are names for five of the nine choirs of angels. The others are seraphim, cherubim, principalities, and virtues. Interesting. In the first Eucharistic prayer, the priest prays, Command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high. At the end of a funeral mass, he prays, Hasten to meet him, angels of the Lord, and may the angels lead you into paradise. Moreover, angels look after us. From infancy to death, we are each surrounded by the watchful care and intercession of our guardian angel. I assure you, Christ said, speaking of children, their angels in heaven constantly behold my heavenly Father's face. Now, Satan was originally Lucifer, meaning light bearer. St. Jerome and other church fathers gave the name to the angel who became Satan by taking a passage from Isaiah in, con in conjunction with Luke. It's worth looking those up if you're interested. Lucifer was a great angel that he and the other demons became evil by their radical, right down to the roots, irrevocable and free choice to reject God and his reign. Then the Bible says, war broke out in heaven. The archangel Michael and his angels battled against the dragon. Although the dragon and his angels fought back, they were overpowered and lost their place in heaven. The huge dragon, the ancient serpent known as the devil or Satan, the seducer of the whole world, was driven out. He was hurled down to earth and his minions with him. And a loud voice in heaven cried, Woe to you, earth and sea, for the devil has come down upon you. Jesus, who said he had seen Satan fall from the sky like lightning, 
called him the prince of this world. That is why the devil, in an effort to tempt Jesus away from his duty, could promise him all the kingdoms of the world in their magnificence. Satan brought death to man from the beginning, Jesus said, and has never based himself on truth. The truth is not in him. Lying speech is his native tongue. He is a liar and the father of lies. It was a lie by which Satan deceived Eve. He told her that the moment she and Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, their eyes would be opened and they would be like gods who know what is good and what is bad. That was the temptation, to stop trusting and obeying God out of trust and to find out for themselves what was good and what was bad. I never understood this properly. I always accepted it, of course, but I never understood it until um, when Father and I were teaching RCIA. On one occasion, after our talk on the commandments, a lady, practicing, very good as far as I can tell, lady, said, you know, Maureen, I sometimes wish I had committed these sins so I would know for myself they were wrong. And I remember saying, I think you've just said what Eve said. I want to know for myself. And isn't that the temptation? I want to know for myself. Father, who's been in a number of parishes with an elementary school, said elementary school children trust their parents and teachers about the evils of drugs. But in high school, they want to find out for themselves. And it, isn't that the temptation that, I, I didn't fall for it, thank God, at university, try it, find out for yourself. You try a drug for yourself, you're damaged. It's Too also, late. It's also the temptation, I'm sure a lot of other women have had the same temptation, from a man. Come to bed with me, you might like it. Don't just do it because you've been told it's wrong. Find out for yourself. And my own niece, we were talking one day, and somebody mentioned the devil, and she said, well, what is this devil anyway? So I took her aside and explained how Adam and Eve fell. And she sat there, obviously listening, and she said, but isn't that the way it always is? Daddy says, don't go near the cliff because it's dangerous, but I do because I want to see for myself. You know, you see a sign when you're driving down the road that there's a curve, and it says speed, 60 kilometers per hour, for instance. So you take it at 60, and you think, I could do faster than that. I can go faster than Let that. Let me try. I wonder how fast I can take this curve. Yeah. We should not be deceived, and some people are, by Satan's argument that we must do evil in order to understand it, combat it, and avoid it more effectively. Now I know how fast I can go around that curve, but it's too late. You can see the fallacy here most clearly, perhaps, in the case of drugs or a hot stove. Or speeding. In finding out for yourself, you damage yourself. In Paralandra, the king and the lady reject Satan's temptation. Later, trying to explain how they know what evil is, even though they have remained innocent, the king says, We have learned of evil, though not as the evil one wished us to learn. We have learned better than that, and know it more, for it is waking that understands sleep, and not sleep that understands waking. <laughs> there is an ignorance of evil that comes from being young. There is a darker ignorance that comes from doing it, as men by sleeping lose the knowledge of sleep. What an insight. You, you notice we keep recommending this book, Paralandra, there's nothing in it which is in any way different from what the church teaches or what the book of Genesis says, but it makes you understand it somehow. It gives you insight, oh. like a poem will give insight yeah. into a truth. St. Augustine calls the devil's temptation an instigation to pride in the sense of self-assertion. In pride... Adam and Eve, who depended on God for their very existence, 
tried to set up on their own, to exist for themselves, like him. God had planned to divinize them, the Catechism says, make them divine, like himself. But they wanted it without him, before him, and not in accordance with him. As a young man wants a regular allowance from his father, which he can count on as his own, so they desired to be on their own, to take care for their own future, to plan for pleasure and security, to have something of their own from which no doubt they would pay a reasonable tribute to God in the way of time, attention, and love, but which nevertheless would be theirs, not his. They stopped trusting God for their existence and the fullness of life. At Satan's suggestion, they began to suspect that God was a rival, curtailing their freedom, that they must get rid of their dependency on him if they wanted to be fully themselves. They became unwilling to rely on his love, which they began to see as untrustworthy, there's a beautiful example of that in a short story by Daphne du Maurier called The Archduchess. Instead, they turned to the tree of knowledge for the power to shape the world, to make themselves gods, to overcome death and darkness by their own efforts. And thus they trusted in deceit rather than in truth and sank into emptiness, into death. But if we sincerely reflect on ourselves and our history, we have to admit that this describes not only Adam and Eve, but all of us. We all carry within us a drop of the poison of that way of thinking. We start out so well with such good intentions. The sin of pride, asserting ourselves against God, is the fall in every individual life and in each day of each individual life. The basic sin behind all particular sins. At this very moment, you and I are either committing it, or about to commit it, or repenting it. It is committed daily by young children and ignorant peasants, as well as by sophisticated persons, by those who live alone no less than by those who live in society. I'm going to read the footnote 135 because it's something that is a temptation to me every morning. We know that our time on earth is God's gift, and we try when we wake to lay the new day at God's feet. But before we have finished, it has become our day, and God's share in it is felt as a tribute which we must pay out of our own pocket, a deduction from the time which ought, we feel, to be our own. For Adam and Eve, the consequences of their rebellion were tragic. They lost their familiarity with God. They became afraid of him, imagining him to be jealous of his prerogatives or rights. They lost their internal harmony, the control of their soul's spiritual faculties over their bodies was shattered. Lust and domination took the place of their marital harmony. Alienation and hostility replaced their harmony with the rest of creation. Finally, they suffered the consequence explicitly foretold by God. Creation became subject to decay, and death made its entrance into human history. By their human nature, Adam and Eve were mortal. They would die. However, by the divine nature to which God had planned to raise them, they would be immortal, they would not die. But divine nature had to be a gift from God, and by their sin, which was an attempt to be like God in competition with God, and therefore apart from God, they had cut themselves off from God as far as they could. As an unavoidable consequence, then, they would now be subject to death. This is precisely what God had warned them about when he said, the moment you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you are surely doomed to die. It might, you might find footnote 140 interesting, um, a sort of 
insight into this from Scott Hahn. Another consequence was that the soul's control over the body was shattered. Adam's body lost the grace whereby every part of it was accustomed to be obedient to the soul. That's from St. Augustine. It was as God's delegate that the soul had had this authority over the body and the psyche. When it revolted against God, it ceased to be his delegate and lost its authority. Now God began to rule the body according to the patterns of ordinary biochemistry. And so it began to suffer pain and senility as well as death. He began to rule the psyche according to the psychology of the higher apes. So human consciousness began, became what it is now, limited to a small part of the brain. From now on, desires began to arise from the body and the psyche, not as the soul chose, but according to the ordinary patterns of biochemistry, psychology, and environment. And all the human will could do was force them back by sheer power, thus forming the subconscious as we now know it. Henceforth, the human soul was not only a weak king over human nature, but also a bad one, having turned from God to itself, making itself its own idol. It could not turn back to God except by painful effort. The attitudes most congenial to it now were pride, the desire to be lovely in its own eyes, envy, the urge to depress all rivals, and ambition, the search for more and more security. Accordingly, it began to send down into the psyche and the body desires far worse than those they sent up into it. By his success with Adam and Eve, who were the father and mother of the entire human race, the devil acquired a certain domination over them and the world. In fact, the world as a whole became subject to him who thenceforth had the power of death. In addition, the devil can acquire a more specific domination over certain individuals. The Bible tells us that Jesus cast out devils from a number of people who had been possessed by them. Since baptism brings about liberation from sin and its instigator, the devil, the priest pronounces one or more exorcisms over people right before baptism. An exorcism is an adjuration in which the devil is either commanded to depart from a possessed person or forbidden to harm someone. During the scrutinies in which the church prepares those about to be baptized, the priest says one or more of the following. Defend them from the power of Satan. For Satan's crushing yoke Exchange the gentle yoke of Jesus. By your power, free these elect, these chosen, from the cunning of Satan. Free those who are enslaved by the father of lies. Free from the grasp of death those who await your life-giving sacraments and deliver them from the spirit of corruption. Free them from the slavery of Satan, the source of sin and death who seeks to corrupt the world you created and saw to be good. And there are some other prayers there which you might like to look at in footnote 149. Although Satan acts in the world out of hatred for God, causing grave spiritual injuries and indirectly even physical injuries, both to individuals and to society, we remain free. Satan is powerful, but his power is not infinite. He is only a creature, a being made by God. He cannot prevent the building up of God's reign. Moreover, his activity among humans will not go on forever. He knows his time is short. That's from the Bible. On the night before he died, Jesus reassured his apostles, You will suffer in the world, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Indeed, St. John says that the reason the Son of God appeared 
was to destroy the works of the devil. I like that passage from St. John. I think it's one of my favorite points. Fear not, I have overcome the world. You know, the things, night before he was about to be crucified. Everything seems to have gone wrong. I mean, he just told his apostles, I'm going out to be crucified. And then he says, but don't worry, boys, I have won. Yeah. And this we have to constantly remember, especially in, in any times of difficulties when we just realize that God is in charge. Mm -hmm. We cannot fully understand the transmission of original sin to the whole human race, says the Catechism. The fact that through one man's disobedience, all became sinners. However, in Adam and Eve, the parents of the race, it was human nature itself that God had endowed with holiness and justice. By their sin, our first parents altered that nature. The soul became perverted and its relation to the rest of the organism was disturbed. It was not like the start of a bad habit or the loss of an organ. It was more like a mutation, a genetic variation which could be inherited, more like the emergence of a new species. Adam and Eve could no longer transmit human nature to their descendants in its original innocence but only in a fallen state. Adam and Eve committed the original sin, but we contract it like a disease. For us it is a state, not an act. In this state, human nature is wounded in its original powers, inclined to sin, and subject to ignorance, suffering, and death. However, it has not been totally corrupted. Baptism erases original sin and turns our nature back toward God, as we shall see. Even so, the consequences of original sin persist and condemn us to a lifelong spiritual battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. The fall is the key to history, says Lewis. Terrific energy is expended. Civilizations are built up. Excellent institutions devised. But each time something goes wrong. Some fatal flaw always brings the selfish and cruel people to the top, and it all slides back into misery and ruin. As the English poet, poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge put it, a fall of some sort or other is the fundamental postulate of the moral history of man. Without this hypothesis, man is unintelligible. Why does every good effort fall? With it, every phenomenon is explicable. The fall explains our own behavior, St. Paul says. I do not do the good I will to do, but the evil I do not intend. My inner self agrees with the law of God but I see in my body's members another law at war with the law of my mind. Think of the love with which a marriage begins, and of the selfishness which corrupts it. The fall explains the behavior of so-called innocent babies and children, even before they know right from wrong. Just listen to an infant's scream of pure egoism, or watch a youngster's efforts to get around his parents' rules. I can't help but think of the situation when I was a child. I remember being told not to pick the apples on a certain tree. So I climbed up on a chair and nibbled around an apple, ate it, leaving just the core. On the tree? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't pick the apple. I obeyed. I got spanked and deserved it. And you but knew. I, I knew, knew you were doing I wrong. I knew I was yeah. doing wrong, yeah. but I tried to justify it. I didn't pick the apple. That's what <laughs> I was told not to do. We're such, we're such fallen creatures, and maybe not all as bad as me, but it's certainly <laughs> there's, there's something in us, in all of us. Babies and children mm. are not innocent. They are born subject to original sin, and that has to be remembered. It is indeed a fallen world. It's an interesting expression, isn't it? You know, so often you hear on the news, innocent 
ch children and women. I haven't met them yet. No. We're fallen creatures, all of us. Why did God allow the original sin? The answer is because he had given Adam and Eve the free will they needed to relate to him in love. Love has to be free by its nature. And free will entailed by logical necessity the possibility of their rejecting him. Why did God permit the original sin's consequences? Why did he not just erase them? He could have done, but he would have had to do the same for the second sin, the third, and so on forever. And that would mean taking away our free will. For if he always corrected a wrong choice, we could not be said to have any real choice at all. The fact that God did not erase the original sin's effects does not mean that he could not do anything about them, or that they took him by surprise and spoiled his plan. God saw, or it's better to say sees, the whole of history, including Jesus' crucifixion, in the very act of creation. In giving us free will, God permitted the original sin and its consequences. But even when we lost his friendship through disobedience, he did not abandon us to the domain of death. And you may recognize those words from Eucharistic Prayer 4. On the contrary, he immediately promised that he would conquer evil and restore human nature. And I think I'm going to read footnote 173. This seems to be God's way. For example, when the Israelites complained against God and Moses during their crossing of the desert, the Lord sent among the people seraph serpents, which bit the people so that many of them died. Even after they repented, the serpents did not vanish. Instead, Moses, at God's command, made a bronze serpent and mounted it on a pole. And whenever anyone who had been bitten by a serpent looked at the bronze serpent, he recovered. Similarly, Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all who believe may have eternal life in him. God does us the honor of taking what we do seriously. He doesn't erase it. He takes it seriously. But if it's evil, he gives us a way to repent. And that's what we'll talk about. That, in fact, is the reverse side of original sin. And beyond our topic for this session, except for a few hints, St. Augustine said that God would never allow any evil if he were not so all-powerful and good as to cause good to emerge from evil itself. St. Leo the Great said, Christ's inexpressible grace, graciousness, gave us blessings better than those the demon's envy had taken away. St. Paul said, despite the increase of sin, grace, graciousness, has far surpassed it. And the church says, I remember when the church said this as one of the prayers in the offertory at every Mass. It's no longer one of the prayers in the offertory. Uh, it comes from a sermon by St. Leo the Great. God wonderfully created the dignity of human nature and still more wonderfully restored it. So the last stage, the last state is better than the first. Accordingly, the church dares to sing in the exultet at the Easter Vigil, O happy fault, which gained for us so great a redeemer. We would have never known the redemption of man if man hadn't fallen, and now our state is greater than ever. So, so there's our bibliography, mostly C.S. Lewis. Also, Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Okay. So, what are we reading for? Well, if you read the passage which we prescribed, we encouraged you to read last week, it was chapters 1 to 19 of the book of Genesis. And that, those show the fall of man and how God began the promise of redemption. In the Bible reading for this week, you will see how God continued that search for man, calling and testing 
the patriarchs of his chosen people, the Israelites, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, hoping to find people he could use to accomplish his plan to save the whole fallen human race. We will discuss in detail God's plan of salvation beginning two weeks from now in the story of salvation. However, before we can do that, we must look at and tackle the question of who is Jesus Christ? And that's what we will be looking at in next week's talk. Who is Jesus Christ? In so, Genesis chapters 20 to 33. Yes. In the meantime, may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. You're welcome.